they discovered upon their arrival was almost unspeakable. We thought all evil needs some form or another. I'm not guilty. The dead won't bother me. It's the living you gotta worry about. Some, if I couldn't keep them there with me whole, I, at least I felt that I could keep uh, their skeletons. Hello, and welcome to the Bad Taste Crime Podcast. I'm Vicky, And I am Janelle. And we're back again. Um, Barely. With a fresh new set of tech problems <laughs> that we're always trying to figure out, but it's okay. Yes. New year, new tech problems. We, <laughs> we kind of got it solved. I'm sure mm-hmm. it's fine. I mean, I'm sure this is totally recording and we're not going to have to redo it. <laughs> oh, my God. I would die. That has happened far too many too. times. I feel like way too, way more than it should happen. Wasn't but, it only once? <laughs> I thought it happened twice. More, I think any, caught any more than time. zero is way too many times. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got a great show for you here in 2021. But first, let's head over to the newsroom. All right, so New Year, tons of new laws go into effect. This is actually one of my favorite times of year because they announce all of the um, stuff that the House and Senate in Illinois is working on passing or just recently passed or stuff that goes into effect on January 1st. And I love reading through some House bills. So (laughs) I mean, I'll take the Cliff Notes version, (laughs) (laughs) which is what I'm here to give you, which is kind of the Cliff Notes version, because there is a whole hell of a lot in this bill for real. So are you specifically talking about Illinois? Yeah, so I'm talking (laughs) talking about specifically Illinois House Bill 3653, and it was this sweeping criminal justice reform, and there are some people who say that it doesn't go far enough, and I'm sure that is true, but there's a lot of really good stuff in here. Yeah, I read into it because I work in a rural community, and there was Mm -hmm. a lot of people literally like freaking out complaining about it yeah yeah (laughs) it's like really guys (laughs) i know so there's a ton of good stuff i wanted to go over some of the big points because at the moment it's passed both the house and the senate in illinois and is moving on to be signed by governor pritzker at which he will (laughs) i would like to think so at the current moment he hasn't but hopefully he does so the two big things that you're hearing about in the news all over the place is an end to cash bail, mm-hmm. which was the big glaring thing that I was like, yes, thank you. Please. Yes. Hallelujah. Yeah. Which was also the big problem that people were complaining about was they're like, oh, just let criminals free. It's like, um, right. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, you guys have never, ever looked into bail. <laughs> yeah. So the end of cash bail or what a lot of people are trying to refer to as a pretrial release program essentially means that for low level offenders, you aren't going to have this requirement of a bail amount that keeps people in pretrial detention for very long periods of time. Mm -hmm. You know, that whole like line where it's like innocent until proven guilty. Right. Well, well, bail, bail assumes that you're guilty. So we're going to keep you in jail. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Exactly. Because you just don't have... And sometimes we're talking thousands of dollars in bail amounts most of the time. That's not something that everybody has. I would say probably most people do not just have, you know, thousand bucks laying around or whatever. It's usually way more than that. It's usually like $5,000 or more. And oftentimes in our state, it's like $100,000 depending Mm -hmm. on the crime. But I mean, this has become... A business in and of itself, because then you have bail bondsmen who are putting up bail for you and you owe them collateral. It's just like a, yep. you know, a loan. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it also makes it more difficult for people to get in touch with their attorneys and work mm-hmm. with their attorneys because you only have certain 
visitation times and stuff that you can get together with your attorney when you're incarcerated. Now it's especially difficult because of the coronavirus and the Mm -hmm. limited amount of people that are being let into jails and prisons to work with their clients. So that's a good thing. I also want to say, too, this is not like an instantaneous change. This is this happens (laughs) by I think 2025 Mm -hmm. is going to be when they finally phase it all the way out. So don't assume tomorrow everybody getting arrested (laughs) is gonna just be let out you know regardless of the severity of their crime right that's not what we're saying here yeah and it's it's really interesting that i've that was the biggest thing that people were complaining about Mm -hmm. um in you know my reading of you know public forums but it's like that's the probably the least difficult thing in everything that this bill is offering I mean, we never used to have bail. Like, that wasn't a thing. People Mm -hmm. were brought in and released, and they were expected to come back to jail. And if they didn't, then a warrant would go out. So it's like, you're really complaining about something that we've already done for a very long time. (laughs) Right, right. The other big thing that everybody's been talking about in this bill that I just want to briefly touch on is a requirement for police officers to wear body cameras. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm all for it. <laughs> That's great. The Again, this is something that, depending on the size of the police department, um, is going to be phased in through 2025. So that's great. I think those are all good yeah. things. Some of the issues, though, with the, the body cams that I was seeing is that there are no set rules and regulations on the usage of body cams. And that's why people are kind of apprehensive about it, because mm-hmm. a police officer can turn it off. Yeah. And um, there was a lot of discussion about using it as a tool to kind of surveil the public Mm -hmm. and not the actions of the police. So there's some interesting conversations that can be had about body cams. But I mean, overall, in its usage, I think it's a good idea. But there really does need to be rules and regulations put forth uh, because it is different for every department. Yeah. And I know there are some actually in this particular bill, there are some things that for like uh, no knock raids, mm-hmm. you're required to have a body camera in the event that a no knock raid gets approved. Like you have to have it on the whole time. Exactly. So there's some of those things. I agree. There definitely is a larger conversation about privacy and accountability that needs to be had. But mm-hmm. so those are the two big things. Here's what people are not really talking about that I think are also kind of big deals. Personally, I'm like, this is all good. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So a lot of stuff on police accountability. There's a requirement for reporting deaths in police custody. Hmm, who would have thought you had to do that? Right. (laughs) This one I was like, okay, solid. Police (laughs) are now required to, if they are, if they're going to arrest you for resisting arrest, they are required to have an underlying reason for arrest. So they can't... Whoa, really? (laughs) Yeah. So they can't, it is now written in, that they cannot just, if you're, if there was no reason that they were arresting you in the first place, they can't just arrest you for resisting or obstructing. Mm -hmm. They have to actually have like an underlying reason that they were arresting you. Which is fantastic. Right. (laughs) Again, it's these things that I'm like, I kind of can't believe that it wasn't in there already, but here we are. And this is, okay, so this is what kills me. I love my job, but the community in which I work is very, very divided. Mm -hmm. A lot of people where I work are very, very adamant blue lives matter kinds of people. Yeah. And it's a smaller community, so I get it. They want to maintain that, like, quote unquote, hometown feel. I get it. I get what you want. But if you think that things that happen in larger cities cannot happen in your community, you're ignorant. Mm -hmm. It can, it does, and it will. Mm -hmm. The biggest kind of remark that I have seen and heard is that this isn't going to allow police to do their jobs. Okay, (laughs) <laughs> if your police officer can't do his job because he's afraid of getting caught for doing something, then he's not doing his job in the first place. Mm-hmm. If he has to use force and he shoots before he asks questions, 
I'm sorry. No, that's wrong. You're already right. in the wrong. <laughs> right. Yeah. So speaking okay. of excessive force, um, they actually expanded training on use of force and uh, crisis intervention and de-escalation techniques, specifically in relation to mental health awareness and response, which is awesome. There's a requirement now for Illinois police to participate in the FBI's use of force database, uh, which was something that was previously encouraged, but is now a requirement. The prohibition of chokeholds. Oh, wow. I know. (laughs) I just, I can't understand why people are complaining about this. I mean, I know there was stuff put in there that was kind of snuck in, which is Mm -hmm. what happens with all bills, but the general you know, message of the bill is police reform. Why is anybody have a problem with a police officer not choking you? <laughs> yes. Yeah. And w- so what they did, too, is they actually expanded the definition of what is considered a chokehold and took away mm-hmm. the intent requirement. There previously was this, like, with the intent to restrict the airway um, portion in the text. Mm-hmm. That's now gone. You do not have to have an intent, but if you are trying to restrain somebody above the neck, mm-hmm. that's be hard considered a chokehold, <laughs> period. Yep. So no, no more of that, which is great. It's every time someone talks about chokehold, I just remember being a kid. And when you like rough house with your parents, you know, you're like, and your parents are like, stop grabbing your brother's neck. Like, <laughs> you right. that when you're six, don't grab someone's neck. And yet, right. we're like totally chill with police officers being like, let me put you in a freaking wrestling chokehold. <laughs> yes. Just, it, yeah. It doesn't connect in my mind. <laughs> there is now also, there were two duties that were now added to a police responsibility. So police now have a duty to render aid when possible, which means mm-hmm. if They have somebody that has been injured. They have to immediately or as soon as they can assess the injury and and render aid, whether that is life saving or otherwise like Mm -hmm. that's in there, but also a duty to intervene. And Hmm. this means that if they see a fellow officer or somebody designated to use or like designated to make an arrest, basically they have a duty to intervene if they witness excessive force being used when the situation mm-hmm. doesn't call for it, which is kind of cool. Yeah, it's it'll be interesting to see if that plays out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a lot of really good stuff in here. There's some more protections for whistleblowers. There's some more restrictions on use of force and deadly use of force. They can't. There's a bunch of military equipment that they aren't allowed to buy, like fucking armored tanks. <laughs> I was like, going to say, there's a ban on armored tanks, guys. It was like buy armored them tanks and, and RPGs. <laughs> I was like, No police fucking, department yeah. have a tank or RPGs no, ever. They are not the military. Exactly. Ugh. They did add some more rights for prisoners and detainees, things like as they're leaving custody, they now have to be informed of their voter registration and their voter rights, which is kind of cool. Oh, my God, Vicky. What? Somebody complained about that. Why? Because, okay, so this is the remark. Why? Why why, Why do they have to know that what their rights are? They're a criminal. They're not, they, they... they're not allowed to vote. I was like, not oh if you're God. in pretrial detention. I just listened to. There's no, a great- I understand it, but it's like, are yeah. you kidding me right now? So there's a great podcast called 70 million that looks at issues uh, surrounding incarceration. Mm-hmm. And they just did this great episode about um, voting in prison. And most of the time it relates to pretrial detention because of, like you said, there's this, assumption that you are innocent until proven guilty and so those people if they're if they're in pretrial detention at the time of an election are allowed to vote Mm -hmm. interestingly enough in illinois cook county jail became the first 
jail that was designated a polling place. So Mm -hmm. it allowed for inmates to go and vote on on campus and there and basically talked about all of these programs where they're trying to empower people who can vote to do so uh, while they are detained, mm-hmm. which is kind of cool. So check that out because yeah, they got rights to vote too, guys. <laughs> oh my god, it's so and in, so infuriating hearing just the lack of knowledge. It's like you obviously don't know, so maybe you should go look up the information. You yeah. can't, like, you're making all of these assumptions. It's like, d- people still do have the right to vote. <laughs> yes. <sorry>. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm not going to belabor this anymore. There's a lot of really good stuff <laughs> in this bill. I encourage you guys to go check mm-hmm. it out, especially if you live in Illinois, which is, of course, our home state. Mm-hmm. It's worth the read. And I would definitely say, look at the original text of the bill. Because there's a, there's just a lot of good stuff in there. I could go on and on and on. We've there already is. probably spent way too much time about this. I mean, we could um, have done a whole episode on this. <laughs> really? We probably should have. Maybe we will Maybe we'll do that later, at a later date, yeah. once it's all mm-hmm. signed and official. Mm-hmm. But we're going to move right along to Netflix and Kill. This week, we are talking about – it's actually an HBO and Kill. We're going to talk about mm-hmm. Heaven's Gate, The Cult of Cults. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, on a personal note, Heaven's Gate is one of the cults that I find more interesting. <laughs> I thought you were going to say near and dear to my heart. <laughs> I was that trying to find a way to make it sound like I I didn't approve of what happened because I don't necessarily approve of what happened. I mean, but um, they were all adults, <laughs> right? But brainwashing also. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> So for those of you that don't know, Heaven's Gate was a cult that started in 1975 that kind of surrounded this idea that UFOs were coming down to pick up these people from their vehicles or their human bodies and take them away into space as they make their exit. Uh, and they had these these two leaders, T and Doe. Doe was a man named Marshall Applewhite who uh, had met T like – way long ago and the two of them went off and started this cult so it's a four episode series it kind of looks at from the beginning from the two of them meeting to the exit or the mass suicide that happened in 1997 which was actually the largest mass suicide on u.s soil i i have you seen this janelle have you watched this yet i have yes i I really liked it, as I do with a lot of stuff <laughs> like this. Yeah, HBO, I feel, does, like, a really good job. Sometimes Netflix, like, for the most part, their series are good. But there's every one, like, one every once in a while that's kind of like, ugh. Yeah. <laughs> like, too long. Too drawn out. Mm-hmm. But I feel like HBO does a better job with the way that they do their uh, documentaries and docuseries. Yeah, and they do this this kind of like these animations to kind of explain things that I I really mm-hmm. liked and I I always get a little like apprehensive when people are like, "Oh, there's, you know, some animations, illustrations, recreations." And I'm like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. "But these were okay. There wasn't too much. Like sometimes it's too no. much." <laughs> yes, yeah. And really, I mean, when you're talking about people literally being pulled up into a spaceship like you're not going to have straight up pictures and video of that either, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> but they do talk to a handful of the former members and some of the members' uh, surviving family in the documentary that kind of tell the story of Heaven's Gate. And I think having the former members there discussing it kind of brings light to why these people were following T and Doe to begin with. Mm-hmm. One of the points that they make and that I think is really important to remember is the media and I think the general public reaction to something like this is to think these people are crazy. These people are so dumb for falling for this. But these are all very intelligent people. Mm-hmm. And this can truly happen to anybody. And mm-hmm. they all were living you know, regular conformist lives before that. So like, it's I think something that people need to remember when you're talking about these cults is it's not just a joke. Like these are this is some serious shit. Anytime. Yeah. 
you're talking about somebody being in a cult. I think in recent years, with religion becoming a more serious discussion, and I think with the amount of people being skeptical of religion in the world, like, Mm -hmm. we're starting to have more of these discussions about kind of what is a cult, what isn't, what is brainwashing, what is going too far, what isn't kind of stuff. So I don't know. It was it was a good watch. Yeah, we'll we'll discuss more about cults on our anniversary episode. <laughs> oh, are we going to? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes, That's we exciting. Are. <laughs> <laughs> News to you, Vicky. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's or you told pick. me and I forgot, which is <laughs> equally as likely, I think. Yes, probably. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's Heaven's Gate, The Cult of Cults. It's on HBO. Check it out. This is that part of the show where we say content may not be appropriate for all listeners. I don't know if I actually have anything that's too terrible in mind today. I don't think anybody dies in mind. <laughs> and not immediately, oh, lucky. anyway. <laughs> yeah. So on today's episode, I kind of am surprised that we have not covered this yet. Because it seems so obvious. But. (laughs) Does it? (laughs) I mean, it's like that classic crime. Yeah. We usually kind of go towards a different sort. True. We do talk about murder (laughs) a lot. Like a lot. Yes. Mm -hmm. So today, we are talking about bank robberies. Pew, pew. Mm -hmm. Pew, pew, pew. (laughs) I was thinking of the the classic, like, (laughs) (laughs) the Wild West, like, you know, mm-hmm. bags Jesse with James. dollar signs on yes. them. And mm-hmm. <laughs> it's funny that you bring that up because. Oh, God. My case, the guy is very, very adamant about distinctions of different types of robbery. So. Oh, God. <laughs> That'll be fun. It's going to be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> but first, we are going to actually head over to the UK because Ooh. we are talking about the Brinks Mat robbery. Mm-hmm. So, in the early morning of November 26, 1983, six armed men walked into a warehouse at Heathrow Airport wearing balaclavas. The men had been tipped off thanks to an inside contact that there were three million pounds in cash in a vault on the property, which they knew belonged to Brinks Matt Security Company. I also want to say, because I just said three million pounds in cash, we're talking like British currency, not like three yes, million not, pounds in yes. weight. Okay. <laughs> just, weight I'm just making cash. that clear because it might become <laughs> unclear later. Mm-hmm. Do you have the how much that is in US currency? I do not. What did I say? Three million? Three million pounds, yeah. Should be more pounds, in US then. Two dollars. It's about four. It's over four million dollars. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Good to know. So Anthony Black, he is the security guard who was kind of their man on the inside. Black was nice enough to open the door for the robbers when they arrived. He just let them in. And Black was like, He kind of got sucked into this heist because his brother-in-law was Brian Robinson, who is the man who's kind of leading this gang of robbers as they go to rob the Brinks map, along with Mickey McAvoy, who was also kind of one of the ringleaders. Now, upon entering the warehouse, they got all the guards who were there together, tied them up, and then poured gasoline on them and threatened to light them on fire if they didn't do what they were told. Then, after they got the keys and the code numbers that they needed, the robbers made their way to the vault where they discovered not the cash that they had been hoping to get, but they found more than 70 tons of gold bullion. So instead of trying to search around for the cash, they decided to pack up close to 7,000 gold bars and 26 million pounds in gold, diamonds, and cash and made their getaway. Can I just say... That is a lot of weight to carry. (laughs) Yes. And one of the things they point out is this van. They had like a van that they drove in is now like weighed down by all all of this gold. Yes. Literal bars of gold. (laughs) They tried to make like a quick escape, but because the van was so heavy, it kind of just like lumbered along, you know? (laughs) Uh, 
as they left, one of the robbers said to the tied up guards, quote, thanks ever so much for your help. Have a very nice Christmas. And then they left. Right. I was not going to. That is the most British thing I've ever heard. I was not going to try to to do my do British accent? accent and embarrass myself. Yeah. Oh, come on. <laughs> not today. Give it a go. Give it a go. No, no. So the robbers, like to do we it, said. Vicky? I'll do it. I'm just, you see how quickly I'm just breezing on past it? Like, <laughs> okay, Janelle, you go for it. Okay. What was the line again? Line, please. <laughs> Thanks ever so much for your help. Have a very nice Christmas. Thanks ever so much, love, for your help. Have a nice Christmas. <laughs> Perfect. There we go. That was beautiful. Go. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All those years of theater pay off. <laughs> <laughs> so the robbers left in a van that was now weighed down with literal shit tons of gold and <laughs> tried as quickly as they could to put as much space between themselves and Heathrow Airport. Now, once you have that much gold, you have to figure out a way to either spend it or get rid of it as quickly as possible. Because all those gold bars have serial numbers on them. They're very easy to trace. Like, you got to get that shit on the black market or something. So it seemed like Robinson and McAvoy used a portion of the money to buy a property in Kent. Mm. McAvoy then (laughs) bought a pair of Rottweiler dogs for protection, which he named Brinks and Matt. Okay, that's two on the nose. <laughs> <laughs> but very, like, I feel like that's a very mobster thing to do. Oh, it is. <laughs> right? Like, name your dogs after the crime you just committed. <laughs> they then had to figure out how to get rid of the rest of the gold ingots. So the standard way at the time, and I'll be honest, I don't know a lot about getting rid of, like, actual bars of gold so this might still be the standard way i have no idea but what you would do is you would have the pure gold melted down and mixed with copper and other metal to kind of like camouflage it because you Mm -hmm. couldn't just go out and sell pure gold pure gold Mm -hmm. for this robinson and mcavoy looked to kenneth noy who was a crime boss that later is lovingly referred to as the road rage killer Mm. (laughs) Mm. (laughs) because he gets involved in a road rage incident where he stabbed and killed the other driver and received a life sentence in 2000. That's what happened there. Mm. So Noy, along with a man named Brian Reeder, handled the gold, sending some of it to Bristol to be smelted down and mixed with copper and brass. And this got rid of about 13 million pounds worth of the gold. Some of it was also sent to a man near Bath named John Palmer, who began smelting the gold down in like this little, they talk, they called it like a smelting hut, basically, on his Mm -hmm. property. Interestingly enough, only two days after the Brinks Mat robbery took place, Palmer's neighbors, Ray and Honor Poulston, called the Avon and Somerset police to report this like suspicious activity of him just being in there forever smelting this stuff down. Police are dispatched, and they even went to where the smelting hut was at, but they opted not to do anything because the hut itself was just outside of their jurisdiction. Of course. <laughs> Out of sight, out of mind. <laughs> right. Well, and I'm like, that, I don't know. That just seems weird to me. So <laughs> they said they would pass on the information to the police department whose jurisdiction it was, and they left. The Polstons didn't hear anything after that about it for 14 months when <laughs> Scotland Yard actually came in and did a raid on the property. <laughs> okay. Apparently, they said that they had been led to that property from other evidence and that they had never heard about this tip. But there was something in the Scotland Yard's like records that got released later that said they actually knew about the tip and for whatever reason didn't act on it. So there's that, I guess. <laughs> After the raid on the property, Palmer was arrested and charged in connection with the Brinks Mat robbery and admitted that he had smelted the gold, but he claimed that he didn't know the gold was stolen. So he actually got acquitted of all the charges. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, the indicator would be like the fact that they have a huge quantity of gold bars with serial numbers on them. <laughs> that might be like a clue. Yeah. That 
they might not own that. <laughs> yeah. So the thing is, is Palmer actually used to be a jeweler. So like he still did some side work for the companies that would smelt down all this metal and make jewelry out of it. Mm-hmm. And for, I got the impression that he received this gold somehow through a jeweler company that was connected to crime organizations mm-hmm. that would smelt. So, so, I mean, plausible deniability, the yeah. best kind of deniability. <laughs> the only kind of deniability. <laughs> <laughs> now, Noy seemed to be causing his own problems when, after being discovered during a surveillance sting, Detective Constable John Fordham was stabbed 11 times. Oh, wow. Noy was charged with murder, and he went to trial in 1985, claiming self-defense. He was acquitted of all of the charges, but only a few months later, after police discovered 11 gold bars on his property, Noy was sentenced to 14 years in prison when he was convicted of handling the Brinksmat gold. He served only half of that sentence, was released, and two years later in 1996 was when he stabbed the motorist uh, in the road rage incident. In the initial investigation of the robbery, police pretty quickly zeroed in on Anthony Black, who was that security guard who let all the robbers in. (laughs) He, like, almost immediately, because I get the impression he was not, like, a regular person involved in crime. Like, he just Mm -hmm. happened to have this connection with somebody who was a professional criminal, right? He pretty much gave up Robinson and McAvoy, like, right away. Mm both of which were sentenced to 25 years in prison for their parts in the robbery, and Black, for his part, received six years. Now, on to the reason why I chose this particular bank robbery. Okay. Because there's two big reasons. One is because of the curse of the Brinks Mat Millions. Mm, okay. Which is like cursed gold. And... Mm-hmm. The other is because of some newly uncovered facts, thanks to the leaked Panama Papers in 2016. So first, let's talk about the curse. It's believed that more than 20 people with some connection to the Brinks Mat robbery have been killed. <laughs> okay. Not at all because they're criminals. <laughs> Not because they're criminals, which is kind of, it's really funny because almost all of these people are like connected to some sort of criminal enterprise or criminal organization and end up getting like shot in front of their house in a very (laughs) like mob style hit but it's not because of that it's because of the gold (laughs) obviously (laughs) so i just wanted to go through a couple of these because i think they're i don't know you you can tell me at the end what you (laughs) (laughs) okay Okay, so first of all, a man named Sally Nahomi was a jeweler who had aided in disposing of some of the gold. He was murdered outside of his home in North London in 1998. A man named Gilbert Winter, who was an associate of Nahomi's, disappeared from a home he shared with his girlfriend in 1998 and is assumed to be murdered. Brian Perry, who had a part in handling the gold and received nine years in prison, was shot dead in Southeast London in 2001. George Francis, who was a former associate of the Cray Twins mm. with links to the Brinksmat robbery, was shot dead in a South London street in 2003. Charlie Wilson, who was also well known for his train robberies, played a part in laundering some of the gold and was shot dead along with his dog on the doorstep of his home in Marbella, Spain. Oh, not the dog. <laughs> yes. I don't know why mine... Tend to have animals that also die. That's not intentional. Yeah, Vicky, God. <laughs> it's not what on purpose. Do to me? <laughs> of course, Detective Constable John Fordham was stabbed 11 times, as I talked about earlier. And then John Palmer, who had originally been acquitted of his involvement in smelting down the gold, was shot dead in June 2015. So that's just a couple of them. Thoughts? <laughs> I mean, it sounds like they lived a life of crime. They all sound mob related, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just like the montage in Goodfellas where all the people mm. related to the crime mm-hmm. locked up dead. <laughs> <laughs> Shocking, right? Oh my mm-hmm. God. 
So that's that. There's this kind of theory that anybody who handled the gold in any way is going to end up dead. Maybe because of the gold, maybe because of crime. We're not here to say, but (laughs) it happens. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Now on to the Panama Papers. It's been a long year. There's a lot of shit that's happened. So I'm just going to remind you what the Panama Papers were about because this happened all the way back in 2016. And I know it's hard to remember back that far. (laughs) We've lived a decade in between then. (laughs) Now for real. So in 2016, 11.5 million documents were leaked that included financial and attorney client information for more than 214,488 offshore entities. In that leak, information was discovered that pointed to Jurgen Mosak advising Gordon Perry and how to keep some of the profits of the gold. Now, Mossack was the co-founder of the now defunct Mossack Fonseca and Company, which was a Panamanian law firm and corporate services provider that was once the fourth largest provider of offshore services. Now, once the firm's role in global tax evasion was uncovered, they were forced to close their doors in 2018. And when they couldn't they they couldn't recover from the scandal, basically. It it, it just yeah. destroyed them. You know, theft will do that. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, maybe if you didn't participate in so many crimes. You, you wouldn't be, uh, you know, held accountable for said crimes. I'm just saying, yeah. <laughs> now, according to an article by The Guardian, quote, as early as 1986, Mosak had been tipped off that he was unwittingly acting as a director of a company that might be owned by those moving money for criminals involved in the heist. In an internal mem- memo never intended to leave its Panamanian files, Mosak refers to the, quote, famoso robo del deposito de Matt Brink and Londres. And <laughs> records... Something about laundering Brinks. <laughs> Yeah, it's the famous, I think it's the famous rob of the bank, Matt Brink in London. Mm-hmm. Something like that. Let me get my high school Spanish out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and records how a well-meaning informant had telephoned to suggest Mosak should resign immediately from a front company the gangsters secretly controlled, end quote. But Mosak himself didn't seem too concerned about saying the company itself hadn't behaved illegally. He was just like, they're not doing any illegal things. That's fine. So instead of resigning from the company, Mossack became a trusted advisor to the company. While the firm itself closed in 2018, in October 2020, just last year, authorities in Cologne, Germany, issued international arrest warrants for both Mossack and his co-founder Ramon Fonseca for multiple charges, including accessory to tax evasion and forming a criminal organization. So there's that also. Mm -hmm. (laughs) There's an actually a pretty interesting and kooky movie that has Gary Oldman and Benicio Del Toro about the Panama Papers. (laughs) Ooh. Where they play Mossack and Conseco. Oh, really? Yes. It's pretty interesting. Oh, nice. Okay. I might have to check that out. Yeah. So of the close to 7,000 gold bars stolen, very little of it has ever been recovered. It is estimated that around 1996, about half of the gold that had melted down, it had been melted down and recast, had managed to make its way back into the legitimate gold market. Some of the proceeds were laundered through offshore shell companies, a fact we know more about now thanks to the release of the Panama Papers. But at this point, I think it's safe to say that we will probably never see most of the gold ever again. And that's the Brinks Matt robbery. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm not too sad about it. The thing about uh, this episode is I'm not too sad about bank robberies. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, a little bit of a Robin Hood complex. <laughs> oh yeah. I, From you? I yes. I can believe that one hundred percent. So <laughs> y- you know where I lie in this. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. All right, Vicky, are you ready for my bank robbery? 
Yes, I am. All right. So my story is movie worthy. In fact, it is a very crappy movie that was made a couple years ago called Finding Steve McQueen, Stealing Steve McQueen. I forget. Anyway. Oh, God. That sounds... Those are crappy name titles. Yes. it's. Mm, we'll, we'll get to it. This tale is about a bank heist in California by a group of men from Ohio searching for Richard Nixon's millions. Okay. <laughs> yes, I just took you on a crazy ride right there. This is the United California Bank Burglary of 1972. Now, if you're familiar with your U.S. history, 1972 was an election year, and we had old Tricky Dick Nixon vying for re-election against Senator George Tricky McGovern. Tricky Dick. Mm -hmm. Oh, God. I actually have some old Nixon campaign buttons that are pretty interesting. And I think okay. I have a very Goldwater one somewhere, too. Oh, God. <laughs> the random stuff we find. <laughs> people like Roger Stone existed and were active at this point in politics also. So, Yep. Just Richard Nixon was his, like jumping off point yeah yep. <laughs> so nixon was a crook even before watergate i know that is hard to believe um, <laughs> <laughs> in fact his re-election campaign was probably the most crooked in recent history now it's debatable between his and old orange face but i'm gonna say nixon's was probably worse okay in 1971 fika which is a terrible acronym, was passed. FICA, uh, which stands for the Federal Election Campaign Act, uh, was initiated to kind of change the way that campaigns finance themselves. So it became a campaign finance law. Now, FICA required full reporting of campaign contributions and expenditures and also limited spending on media advertisements. In addition, FICA provided the legislative framework for PACs established by unions and corporations, which allowed unions and corporations to use treasury funds to establish, operate, and solicit voluntary contributions for the PAC to be used in federal races. What? So what that says is, before this, a business could directly give money to a campaign fund and said, we support you. They can't do that now because that's kind of mixing business with pleasure, right? So what you could do is say, I'll give you all this money if you make some really awesome legislation that favors whatever sector business that I work in. Okay. So what they're doing is they're taking away that direct source of funding, and they're saying that you can fund a campaign if you create a PAC, which I'm sure you've heard what uh, the term super PAC. Yep. It's the same thing. Yeah. So you can create this pack and you can campaign for this person, but all the contributions have to be given from somewhere. They can't be used directly from your business. Okay. So Nixon was getting millions of dollars from corporations and businesses because this FICA wasn't quite in, you know, it hadn't been really put into legislation yet. Now, it's no surprise that the way he was getting campaign contributions was super fucking illegal. <laughs> right. So he was hiding cash all over the place so that people wouldn't know the millions of dollars that he was receiving from businesses, trade unions, corporations. <sighs> so this election was so corrupt that FICA was amended in 1974, which was, if you didn't know this, the year that Nixon was kicked out of office. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, resigned. He re Wait, he, yeah, he resigned. He's not a crook to know. <laughs> not a crook. Nixon also had taken a considerable amount of cash from trade unions, even the one that good old Jimmy Hoffa was running. <laughs> okay. And if you don't know your U.S. history, Nixon pardoned Jimmy Hoffa, so you can see how that exchange went down. <laughs> oh my god, so many parallels. So, there was also a bunch of money that was given that was called the milk fund money. Nixon shook down the dairy industry for campaign contributions. What? <laughs> Which is like, what? <laughs> oh my gosh, okay. So this is where the burglary comes in. <laughs> now, it's Cleveland in the 70s, and you know that I've covered a many a Cleveland case, but Cleveland in the 70s was full of gangsters, robbers, and of course, the mafia. 
It was the in-between for New York and Chicago. And there were many notorious mafiosos in Cleveland. So it's not a surprise that uh, I'm going to say the heroes of this story got the drop on a crime of the century. <laughs> Do you see all that lingo I'm using? Got the drop. <laughs> it's very like a detective novel. <laughs> Yes. Well, the thing is, so if you guys are completely oblivious to uh, the things we've talked about on this podcast, my parents are from Cleveland mm. and my mother is Italian. So we'll just leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> so there was a Teamsters union in Cleveland and it was pretty notorious. And word got around that Jimmy Hoffa had donated, aka bribed Richard Nixon with about $30 million to go with the flow, so to speak. Now, word was Nixon had stashed the cash in a bank in California. This is where Emil Dinzio became the man for the job. Okay. Emil, yeah. Emil Dinzio is from Youngstown, Ohio, and he was already a well-known burglar. Now, I want to point out that in interviews and in Dinzio's book, he makes note that he is a motherfucking burglar and not a robber. Okay. Here is his logic. Robbers are messy. They have no finesse. They hit banks when they are open, flashing guns and being messy. Burglars are stealthy, well-trained. They take their time and they do things after hours and no one gets hurt. Uh, well, that's a weird (laughs) distinction to make, I think. So, Dinzio wasn't just a burglar. He was also part owner of a coal mining company with his brother, James, called Dinzio Brothers Mining Company out of Salem, Ohio. Very original. Yes. This is going to be key because there's something that they use in mining that they're going to use later. Is it? (laughs) Take a guess. Dynamite? (laughs) Oh, could it be dynamite? (laughs) We'll see. It's either dynamite or it's canaries. (laughs) <laughs> I wish it was both. <laughs> <laughs> so Dinzio got word of the money in January of 1972 from his friend Butchie Sisterino, which you can't not wow. say with an accent. <laughs> Butchie Sisterino. <laughs> now here comes a whole lot of Italian. Are you ready? Oh, Sisterino Lord. ran a Barboda, which is a gambling dice game for the Little Italy mob. <laughs> <laughs> Barboda? A Barboda. <laughs> hmm. So immediately upon hearing of the potential cash, Dinzio assembled a crew and drove to California to scope out the bank in a blow car. Now, a blow car, if you're not familiar because you're not a criminal, is a car registered in a bogus name. Okay. So you could just, well, blow, you you blow it up afterwards, but. Oh, and I would think like a blow car. We'll make a point about that later. (laughs) I always feel if I were to hear that, I I didn't know what that meant, but. Mm -hmm. My initial thought was, like, the getaway car, because to blow Mm -hmm. is to, like, leave quickly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But... Blow this popsicle stand? Yes. (laughs) Yeah. Yep. (laughs) But it also means that you're supposed to blow it up, set it on fire afterwards. Wow. (laughs) So, in this blow car, they had binoculars, a police scanner, lockpicks, a voltmeter, walkie-talkies, and a small amplifier. What the amplifier was used for was to tap into phone lines to listen to alarm systems, because a lot of alarm systems were connected to phone lines. Now, the crew included his brother, James Dinzio, who was the explosives expert, his nephew, Harry and Ronald Barber, and his brother-in-law, Charles Mulligan. They also picked two people outside the family, alarm expert Phil Christopher and Charles Brockle. This is starting to shape up like an Ocean's Eleven style (laughs) Vegas robbery. It really is. They just need a hacker. (laughs) Right? Exactly. They arrived at the bank in in United California Bank in Laguna Niguel, and it was in a shopping center, which is kind of an interesting uh, location, and I'll explain that a little bit more. They cased the joint going inside to locate where the alarm system was and the vault, and kind of get a general layout of the bank. After they had done that, they returned back to Ohio to really begin planning the whole thing. James Dinzio was not only an explosives expert, but also a skilled tool maker. Well, for robbery tools, anyway. (laughs) (laughs) So they needed a drill, and it had to be silent. And they also needed a bunch of other stuff. So he started putting together all of these tools that were going to be quiet and kind of get him into the things without making a bunch of ruckus and noise. 
One of the interesting things that they stated that was necessary for their kit was a canister of cayenne pepper. Can you guess why? No. Cayenne pepper is a really good dog repellent. Okay. So if you sprinkle some cayenne pepper around, it throws the scent off for a dog. They don't like the smell. It irritates their nasal passages. So they're kind of like, ugh. That don't know where I to go. feel like is really good to know. Yeah. Hmm. So the commercial dog repellent sprays are basically just diluted cayenne pepper, kind of like the way mace is diluted mace, which is a, a spice related to right. black pepper. So okay, that's anyway. one of those things I'm gonna keep like <laughs> in my hat until I mm-hmm. need it for some random. You're just gonna have in the pocket cayenne pepper. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like pocket sand, you know? One one pocket is sand, pocket one sand. pocket is cayenne pepper. <laughs> You're covering all your bases. Mm, um, true. <laughs> so, uh, on top of that, <laughs> they needed to get their equipment out there. Flying was just not going to be possible, even though you could fly with dynamite sticks at this time. It was highly frowned upon. <laughs> You could do whatever the fuck you wanted on airplanes in the past. It was the 70s, man. Yeah. Nobody cared. <laughs> now, driving would also be really r- risky because if you got pulled over, how could you explain why you had a bunch of fucking tools and dynamite in your trunk and a lowly oh can God. of cayenne pepper? <laughs> yeah. True. So what they decided to do instead was schedule a delivery through United Van Lines. Now, United Van Lines would take people's belongings across country if they were, like, moving. Okay. So, luckily, they had a friend who already worked for this company, and so they took it off the books for them out there. They just made space in the van during a delivery, and they were good to go. All right. All this started at the beginning of January. By the end of January, the crew was out in California, and things were already going. Okay? It was very quick. The tools arrived via the van at the end of February, and they decided to have most of the crew at the Jubilee Motor Inn, and then they also rented a house to hold the other half of the crew. They wanted to split them up so they weren't always being seen together. They also had to acquire another blow car, and this blow car that they got, they even rigged the car with a toggle switch so that they could kill the lights on the vehicle all at once. Now, they made a point of discussing this because I read Emil Dinzio's book. He's not really one for giving interviews, but he has a book called Inside the Vault, The True Story of a Master Bank Burglar. And it describes the car. I forget the make and model, but the paint was this very light, flashy gold color. And he talks about the car and says that, you know, normally you don't want a car that brings attention. But they were in California – and everybody had flashy cars. So really, this light, gold, beautiful, perfect car was kind of a cover because everybody had really nice, beautiful cars. Okay. So he was kind of like, it was okay that it was flashy because everyone had a flashy car. Right, right. They were so attached to the car, though, because it was so beautiful and nice that they actually wound up not setting it on fire. Oh, <laughs> Which would be a big mistake. Oops. Yeah. I was just thinking, so. man, this is really like <laughs> intricate planning mm-hmm. for a robbery. A bit. Mm-hmm. It really is. So they had the car. They had places to stay. All the equipment was out there. And they were ready to get this plan in motion on March 17th, St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> a few days before the crew stashed the toolkit in the brush just out- down the road outside of the uh, Jubilee Motor Inn. And they were going to come back and kind of pick it up on their way. They didn't want to have everything in their car already, and they didn't want to have it inside of the building because they were afraid that somebody would see it if someone came across, you know, uh, to clean the room or they looked into the window. Yeah. So they stashed it in the bushes. Now, March 17th rolls around. They go to get the tools. They're gone. Uh, uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> so... They were a little concerned, to say the least, <laughs> that the job might have been a setup by the FBI. Oh. Now that the tools were missing, this was kind of making it seem like it was a setup by the FBI. Uh-oh. So, James Dinzio quickly flew back to Ohio and created another set of tools 
and came back, and they pushed the date of the score to March 24th. There were a lot of signs that were happening that perhaps they shouldn't have done this job. Oh, no. Uh, But they rolled with it. Mm -hmm. So the robbery happened in stages over the course of a weekend. They would hit the bank in several stages, taking all the cash that they could. They got to the shopping center and began prepping the place. They climbed up the roof and spliced into some of the power cable so that they could run their tools. Now, this is an interesting point that happened. They sprayed liquid styrofoam, which is used in surfboard making, into the alarm system so that the bell wouldn't ring. That is, like, wicked smart. (laughs) It's wicked smart. (laughs) It's wicked smart. I'm super (laughs) impressed by these guys, actually. This is crazy planning. Like, I would not have thought about that. I know. I read that. I was like, oh, that's genius. Yeah. (laughs) Next, they cut into the roof, which is really easy because the roof was fucking plywood. (laughs) Oh, my God. Cheap construction back then. I know. They then lowered down a light and then a ladder. They then rewired the alarm system to look like it was active, but not actually send out an alert to anyone. So they got all this ready. Then they were ready to get the real job done, which was to prepare a blast hole to blow the concrete wall. They covered the area with sandbags to deaden the sound and to make the blast radius smaller. Okay. Because they're coal mining experts. (laughs) Oh my god, all right. So they actually filled bags full of sand and dirt and created kind of like a little bunker. The funny part was that they buried a meal Dinzio behind a wall of sound uh, sandbags to protect him from the blast. <laughs> so he was in there. Oh my there. god. And that is when they set off 16 sticks of dynamite. Oh my god, Jesus. <laughs> so too much it dynamite. Was a small, yeah, it was a small boom, and then a shake erupted after the de- the detonation. They started to use torches to cut through and into the vault. And then they took their sledgehammers and started going to the safety deposit boxes. Now, there were some discrepancies with the the boxes. Some recounted in their stories, because they interviewed everyone, um, that they had safely gotten the deposit box number that was supposed to be Nixon's. And some say that they never actually got the safety uh, safety deposit box number that was Nixon's. Okay. So there's a little bit of contradictory in the stories of all of the guys involved. Some say they did. Some say they didn't. Are we for sure that like, because when you started off by saying they were stealing Nixon's millions, Mm -hmm. we're for sure that he had that money, right? Or no? He for sure had that money. Okay. He for sure had that money. He was, it was brought up in Watergate indictments as well. Okay. As proof that he was a crook. Gotcha. But finding the money was the problem. And we'll kind of discuss if that really was his deposit box or not. Okay. Now, inside Emil Dinzio's book was this cute little drawing of how they kind of got into the vault. So if you go down the page, you'll see <laughs> it's like a little cartoon guy it, uh, in the hey, bushes really and a little cartoon your, guy. <laughs> your graphics recently. Yeah. So there's you could sell in the right corner Emil Dinzio behind a fucking yeah. wall of sandbags. <laughs> it's just beautiful that's funny. i love it yeah so my question that i pose to you is if it's richard nixon's money he had 30 million dollars stashed supposedly only at this bank how big of a fucking safety deposit box would you need for 30 million dollars even if it was like thousand dollar bills because that was a thing back then was thousand oh my bills. god yeah okay i don't know i mean you'd have to have what like the size of a goddamn house <laughs> yeah yeah at least at least, well, let me think. Because I think most people, when they think of safety deposit boxes, they think of like a like a shoebox. It's a little bit longer than mm-hmm. that, but it's like that shoebox size. They do make safety deposit boxes that are sort of like bigger cardboard box, you know, like a packing mm-hmm. box size. But mm-hmm. even still, like you would need a couple of those at least if you even if exactly. it was like thousand dollar bills. Exactly. So they did take millions of dollars, but there is no exact way to know for sure how much they did take. All in all, there were 452 deposit boxes that were opened and taken. 
Wow. They uh, then, after cleared out all the cash over the course of three days, they did a Friday night, Saturday um, night, and then Sunday. They jammed the vault door from the inside, and they left the ladder and the hole in the roof and took off. In their hurry to leave, they did leave behind a single cotton glove. Oops. Which actually doesn't get them in trouble. It never does. (laughs) It never does. Let's look at this example Um, of OJ, right? Never gets people in trouble. Gloves are fine. Gloves, whatever. Wear all the gloves you want. So they stashed the loot and tools at a friend's house in the in the in the fucking blow car in a garage. Okay. Okay. Not very smart. They then wiped down the house that they were renting and the room in the motor inn, and they returned to Ohio. Some of the cash was straight up buried, some of it was laundered, and some of it was left um, in Las Vegas. The crew laid low for the most part, with the exception of Emil Dinzio. Oh, there's always one. Yes. The cops and the FBI were called in, and approximately 125 FBI agents were working the case at one time. And from the start, they figured that they weren't dealing with a local burglar. They cited that the crime was just too smart. Oh, those poor local they residents. Sent- <laughs> I know. They're like, ah, oh, we're so stupid. <laughs> we're going to Nigel is dumb. Uh- <laughs> So they sent out an M.O., and they sent out that they had a glove as a clue and that they thought it wasn't local. This info was sent via the Telefax system that they used back then, which we've seen on some of the documentaries that we've watched. Yep. (laughs) Oh, yeah. According to records, however, it appears that Richard Nixon actually didn't have an account at that fucking bank. (laughs) Now, that's according to legal documents. This fact is actually still debated quite a bit. There is still a belief that he was using a fake name at that bank for another account. Yeah. There is an account at a bank literally down the street with Nixon's actual name on it. Okay. It's like they just hit the wrong bank. That's what people say. But Nixon more than likely had accounts everywhere with fake names. And the probability of him having an account at that bank as well is still actually pretty high. Well, and I don't know that you would necessarily want to admit that, like, millions of your dollars were stolen either. Mm -hmm. So now there were two things that were really tricky about this, and it was how they eventually got caught. Now, Emil Dinzio is a lifetime burglar. Okay, so Dinzio decided to hit a bank in Lordstown, Ohio, not too long after this big score, because according to his wife in a lot of the interviews, money was just never enough. He could never have enough of it. Okay. This is where his downfall would be. In the Lordstown, Ohio bank robbery, he decided to use the same liquid styrofoam method that he used in the California bank robbery, and that's how he broke in and stole the cash in Lordstown. I can't imagine that was like a really common no, thing for like not. your run of the mill <laughs> thieves mm-hmm. to do. Now, police didn't suspect or link it right away to Dinzio, but they knew that he was a big time burglar and that he had never been caught and he was like a high roller. So they kind of figured he would even, maybe at least know what was going on. So they checked further about, you know, suspected burglaries with no, you know, no ability to really link anything to the Lordstown burglary. But then they realized that the styrofoam was there and it sounded a lot like the robbery in California because that was being sent out to all of the police departments via the Telefax. Mm -hmm. So they started looking into Dinzio and lo and behold, he had a family member living in LA. So they started to make their own connections. They began tracking his movements, and then they met a cab driver in California who remembers a man tipping him $100 for his drive from the airport. He identified Emil Dinzio as the man who tipped him $100. Okay, okay. They eventually found out about the condo and the motor inn. They checked phone records and connected a bunch of phone calls at these two places to Ohio and began connecting others to the crime. The big hit actually came from the condo. Now, remember how I said the crew had wiped down the condo? Yeah. Well, they actually left a couple prints on clean dishes after they had taken them out of the dishwasher and put them into the cabinet. 
Oh, darn. What an oversight. That sucks. (laughs) The next hit came when one of the numbers on the phone records came back connected to a man named Early Dawson. (laughs) What a name. (laughs) All right. They went to talk to Early Dawson, and lo and behold, in his garage was the fucking getaway car, (laughs) which appeared to be registered to a ghost. (laughs) Not not suspicious at all. Mm Mm-mm. Dawson was originally from Youngstown and mentioned that his friend came by to look at the car. Things didn't make sense, so they got a, a, a warrant to search the car. And in the back seat, there was dust and metal particles. So they were like, all right, this is weird. So they opened the trunk and found that there was a trap door under the trunk. And in it, jackpot all the fucking tools. <laughs> <laughs> oh man i'm surprised i'm kind of surprised with how careful they were with the houses that they left all of that behind exactly while the car was being searched charles mulligan was actually calling early dawson like literally while they were searching the car the one of the guys from the robbery calls oh the dude. my god what timing <laughs> so he's like i need to look at the car i need to pick it up <laughs> Okay, so the FBI made sure that Early Dawson set up a meeting at a local bar, which he was then wired so that they could kind of catch uh, Charles Mulligan. Yeah. During the convo, Dawson asked Mulligan if he had anything to do with the robbery, like blurted it out. The cops were like, oh, God damn it. You just blew our cover. (laughs) Right. But because Mulligan was a bit of a braggart, he said he had nothing to do with it. Right. But he said they stole three million dollars, by the way. So kind of like, oh, my God, gave it away at the end. Right. (laughs) Wow. He was like, you know me better than that. But anyway, it was more like five million, not three million. (laughs) Oh, my God. Uh, So the FBI heard that and they just pounced on a motherfucker. Slowly and surely, they started catching the rest of the crew. Charles Brockle squealed, but not about everyone. And then the rest of the crew started to drop. They began watching Dinzio, and a tip from a neighbor stated they saw a man digging in the Dinzio's yard late at night. Now, this led to Dinzio being picked up, and um, the cash was uncovered. He had buried it in his backyard. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Now, here is the tricky part. Uh, Harry and Ronald Barber, his uh, nephews, were still in the wind. Eventually, they caught up to Ronald, but Harry Barber was still MIA, which, of course, what a terrible name, Harry yeah. Barber. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it'd be good for somebody who was in to cutting hair. Mm-hmm. Or maybe a stage name for a stripper. <laughs> yeah. Oh. So Barber changed his name to John Baker and moved to Pennsylvania. He started working as a bartender and had a couple of other odd jobs. He would start to send postcards to the FBI when he traveled on vacation as a T, saying, guess where I am now, boys. <laughs> That's pretty bold. Bold. Real bold. Yeah. He eventually started dating a new lady and was known around town as a real nice guy who would help you out as much as he could. He would go around fixing up people's places and businesses, and he was so trusted by people that they would leave him their car and house keys to work on things when they were gone. Get this. He even fixed up something at the local bank, and the manager left him the keys to the bank so that he could work during off hours. So was he, like, actually stealing all these people's stuff at this point, or not so no, much? No, he wasn't stealing a goddamn thing. Wow. He was literally doing all these odd jobs. Now, one day in 1978, his girlfriend Marlene was washing his clothes, and she noticed that inside a pair of his old jeans was the initials H.J. Barber. Which apparently used to be a thing if you took your clothing to dry cleaners, they would like put your initials in the clothes. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Oh, yeah. So she asked him, who the hell was H.J. Barber? So he spilled it to her. He told her everything. And he even said that she could turn him in for the $5,000 reward. But she refused. And she stated that she was really excited to live with a criminal. Wow. This girl okay. Had a rough so, life. <laughs> I think there's something to be said for the mental state of somebody being like, this is so exciting. I mean, he was just a burglar, so it's not I he was like a murderer. Bad boys. That's what that is. <laughs> exactly. Oh, God. 
Now, Marlene eventually did tell her sister Darlene, and that is so unfortunate. They're named Marlene, Marlene and Darlene. Marlene and Darlene? Oh, <laughs> God. <laughs> but Darlene worked at the sheriff's deputy's office. Wow. <laughs> so Darlene had to tell the deputy, and so she did. Now, here is the fucking hilarious part. The sheriff did nothing. For two years, he lived free and clear with the knowledge that the sheriff knew exactly who he was and had all of the information. That's wild. It wasn't until 1980 that the shoe dropped. Eventually, one of the other members of the sheriff's office decided to send an anonymous tip to the FBI. The tricky thing was the FBI actually couldn't prove his identity as Harry Barber because he had all of this documentation that he was John Baker. Oh. They eventually got a positive ID um, from someone that he had previously known, and he Mm -hmm. was arrested for the robbery. Now, the sheriff was also convicted for harboring a fugitive, but he was eventually acquitted. Now, the town he lived in loved him so much that they raised money for Harry Barber's defense. Wow. Barber was convicted to five years in jail and only served three. His brother also got out of jail and raised his daughters on his own, and they never burgled anything again. Dinzio was the only one. (laughs) (laughs) Dinzio served eight years in jail, and he stayed a criminal and was caught repeatedly again and again. And the last time he was caught, he was attempting to case for another possible burglary. Oh, God. Now, the money that they found totaled a couple million, but according to Harry Barber, there is more out there waiting to be found. In fact, he did an interview with a guy who did a crime podcast where I got some of this information from, but I mean, I'm going to tell you what, it was kind of (laughs) boring. The quote's really great from Harry Barber. He said he's waiting for his final payday. Yeah. The... Information from this came mostly from Inside the Vault, the story of the Master Bank Burglar by Emil Dinzio, but there is also a series by the Orange County Register, I believe, that was eventually turned into that crime podcast that you can look at. It's okay. But the guy who wrote the articles was the one who eventually turned it into a movie, and I have to tell you, the movie is not very good and not even remotely close to the story. Oh, (laughs) dang. You can watch it if you want. It's okay. Um, if you are not thinking about it, it's supposed to be specifically about this. It does have the cast and crew and characters and is loosely based off of this. But I was really disappointed that he didn't make it to a T about this crime because it is movie worthy in and of itself. But that yeah. is the United California Bank burglary. <laughs> I mean, I definitely get like Robin Hood vibes from Barber mm-hmm. that... I feel like you probably really identify with, (laughs) Janelle. Yeah, I just loved that people appreciated him so much in the little town that he lived in in Pennsylvania that they were like, yeah, he was a burglar a couple of years ago, but he's a nice guy. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I mean, what a way to make an impression. Yeah. If you need something to listen to in your getaway car, why don't you check out this podcast? Hey, Sasha. Hey, Courtney. Where can you get hot takes about ghosts, cryptids, farts, and cats? I don't know. Where? On our podcast, Spoop Hour. Oh, that's right. Each week, we talk about the things that spook us out, and we laugh through our fear. You can find us on Twitter and Instagram at Spoop Hour, and you can listen to our podcast on iTunes, Podbean, or really anywhere else that you get your podcasts. Feel free to also drop us a line at spoophour at gmail.com. We want to hear about your ghosts. Thanks. Well, that has been our show, folks. Thank you for joining <laughs> us this week um, for talking about some bank robberies. Eh, switch it up a bit. It was fun. I had a good time. Yeah, Did you have a good nobody time? Nobody died in mine, so. <laughs> Lots of people Anytime died in no mine. Anytime no one dies is a good time for yeah. me. <laughs> Um, if you enjoyed this episode and you want to hear more like this, you can go to badtastecrimepodcast.com where we have all of our episodes. We're also on Apple and Google Play and Stitcher and Pocket Cast and anywhere podcasts are casted. Um, <laughs> are potted. <laughs> are potted. Yeah. You can also go to badtastecrimepodcast.com and get some merch if you need some or donate. There's a donate link there too. Mm-hmm. Um, if you want to support the show, that's all well and good. Uh, mm-hmm. We 
have our four year anniversary coming up. Yes, we'll have some delightful things for you. Yes. <laughs> um, In fact, we'll be bringing a very special live show to you. <laughs> yes. I was thinking, I was trying to think, I don't know when we're going to do it. I know we are planning on doing a live stream. Mm-hmm. It will be sometime around our anniversary, which is the 14th of March. So keep an eye out. We'll release the date and time, but it will yeah. be on our YouTube channel, just like we did for Corn Streams. So. Yes. Yes. So looking forward to that because we haven't done that in a hot minute. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, other than that, Janelle, you got anything else before we close out the show? Um, No, just keep an eye out on our social media. We've been posting more. We took a little break because, you know pandemic times became um, very overwhelming we'll have some, yeah we'll have some new and exciting things coming up so just keep an eye out as we announce stuff yep um on that note our sound and editing is by tiff fullman our music is by jason zaszewski the enigma <laughs> this has been the bad taste crime podcast we will see you in two weeks goodbye bye bye <laughs> Try not to steal anything. <laughs> left their bodies on the hillsides along the highway. It was as if a wave of people washed over this town. We are all people in some form or another. <laughs>